Well then, morning everybody. How are we all doing? Sam here, United People's TV. It's Monday morning. I will tell you quickly at the start of this stream, my bathroom is getting done and there's a lot of noise going around. We've got three builders in, so there might be some distractions. I might be distracted and it's not as if we've got uh, any good football to distract us here this morning because we waited two weeks and then we got pumped. Absolutely pumped by Newcastle yesterday. It, it wasn't just a 2-0. It really, I mean, I know it was on paper, but it, it that could have and probably should have been four, five, six, arguably. I put Van Persie on the mannequin this week. I don't actually think we did a community vote. If we did do, I apologize about that. But look, there's plenty to run through and dissect this morning. I'm going to be here to try and uh, discuss it with you. I'll listen to all your comments. I'm sure there's going to be some that are probably more knee jerk than mine would be. But that's what a community is about. I, I I take your opinions on board and we discuss them. I don't just dismiss them out of hand. Some I might massively disagree with and we'll discuss those. But you can see down there from the headline of the, of the show. It's coming from The Athletic, from Laurie Whitwell and David Ornstein, that Eric Ten Hag has chosen Harry Kane as his number one priority target. I'm going to run through that in about 15 minutes or so. Bring you all of that on the, on the transfer priorities list. And what needs to be done, where Man United's good spending is going to happen this summer. But first of all, we've got to take a look at that performance yesterday. And I will do that. Good morning to everyone now in the community. Who's down here? Carl, I can see you there. Al, we've got Matt Richard, Calvin. We've got Sigmund. How you doing, buddy? Uh, Miss Teacup, Bully, Connor. We've got Rodney. Uh, we've got um, Ant, I can see you there. Josh, Paula, T. Nice to see you back, T. And Jonathan watching on Facebook. Lots of you here. And no doubt this is going to be a, a, a quieter stream than usual this morning because there are some fair weather United fans, uh, but I'm not saying you are because you're all, you're all joining in. And it's easy to enjoy when, you, when you're winning. When you're not winning, well, it's, it's a bit frustrating. Speaking of winners, look at that for a segue. What I want to do here to start the show is congratulate the winner of the PS5. You can see down there what this month's uh, raffle prize is and it's an absolute corker again but I want to say a big congratulations to Umit uh, Barak Cioglu I uh, contacted him straight away and he was absolutely blown he was just shocked massively shocked and it was wicked uh, so we're going to be I'm going to be sending out the PS5 to him today so Umit if you're watching congratulations to you my friend uh, all of you entered it was brilliant and we have now launched the giveaway I don't know, not a giveaway, sorry. The raffle prize for this month. It is an Xbox Series X with Forza 5 Premium Edition. It's a bundle this time. I mean, don't say I don't treat you well. Uh, let me get the link for you, everyone, down here. Again, it's the same as last time. It's very, very simple. If you'd like to uh, win an Xbox... There we go. If you'd like to enter, the raffle ticket is only £1, okay? You can buy one. You can buy two. You can buy as many as you'd like, but it's only... It's up to you. It, it, it's, it's a raffle. It's going to last until the end of the month. Every single time, every single month, we'll be launching and hopefully making the prizes bigger and bigger. This prize is, is bigger than the PS5 prize. And the next month, hopefully, we'll get bigger and bigger on top of that. So a big up to all of you. Julie, you're asking, when are you doing some perfume? It's going to have to be some seriously expensive perfume uh, <laughs> to be bigger prize than that. That's what I would say. There's a super chat there from Estevo. How you doing, man? You're saying we seriously need midfielders. Our midfield was overrun. Newcastle played through our midfield, knowing we had no substance there. And absolutely, um, we know that was a massive, massive key issue. But the, and as I said in my match reaction yesterday, um, I would love to be able to just come here this morning and just blame yesterday on the absence of Casemiro and Eriksen. But I think that would be disingenuous. I think that would be kind of ignoring other patterns and problems that we saw yesterday. And there's no doubt that it was an issue, right? But there were multiple issues yesterday, which we are now going to discuss this morning as a community. Eric Ten Hag was speaking after the game. And the attitude and the application was, of course, highlighted as a major Major issue yesterday. Stephen, you're down there saying PlayStation to Xbox is a downgrade. Man, I'm not getting involved in that argument and that conversation. <laughs> Hell to the no. I've always been an Xbox man. Don't know why. Used to, PS2 was still... No, N64, then PS2. Then probably PS1 in terms of my favorite consoles in my career. In, in my career? <laughs> in my lifetime. 
anyway, Eric Ten Hag speaking about the performance levels and the application. He said, look, we know how tough it is to come here. And I know they want to take revenge. You have to show the same passion, desire and determination of the opponent. We didn't and we got killed. Luke Shaw spoke about it as well. Not good enough. When I speak after bad results, I'm always honest. And I think as a team, we have to be honest. I don't think that Newcastle won the game on quality. It was on passion, hunger, desire, attitude. And that can't be possible. Now, my opinion on that is that's a little bit unfair. I actually thought Newcastle yesterday had quality as well as all the passion, hunger. And it, was, it wasn't anywhere near as bad as the Brentford game, right? But it was pretty painful to watch that match yesterday. And I'm going to speak about what I... I'll be honest, I've um, I've kind of sat on the fence over the De Gea situation now, but I'm not. I'm nailing my colours to the mast today with David De Gea and with the glaring, glaring problem that is going to come back again and again and again and again and again and again and again. It's so easy to play against Manchester United. I could coach a team. That probably wouldn't be good enough. I could tell a team exactly what to do to put Manchester United under pressure if you don't want them to control the game. But when it comes to Manchester United's problems, right, there is there is too much evidence here now. There is too much evidence to suggest that there isn't a pattern. Because that's that's what that's what you have to do in life. And that's that's kind of the opposite of knee-jerk reactions. If we were to after the Brentford game say, oh man, United away from home, we're absolutely abysmal, we can't cope with hostile atmospheres, that would be a bit of a knee-jerk reaction off the back of one result. But if you look at the results that we've had this season and you look at Manchester United's record away from home, remember, by the way, that we are currently fourth. Right now, we are currently on par for where we would love to, not love to end the season, but if we finish inside the top four, it's considered a very good season. Look at these numbers here. Only four teams have conceded more goals away from home than Manchester United in the Premier League this season. Bournemouth, who are 16th, Leicester, who are 19th, Nottingham Forest, who are 15th, and Leeds, who are 17th. Yet, we're fourth. And it just goes to show how in incredible Manchester United's home form has been and also how abysmal Manchester United's away form has been. Now, I, I think that deserves a video unto itself. And there's a, there, there's a lot of explanation. Not, not a lot, a lot of explanations. There's some mitigating factors going into yesterday. The two-week break between um, last game and this game. It's exactly what happened between Arsenal and City. I was worried about it, and the same thing happened. These players seem to, whenever they step out of the Ten Hag and the United circle, feels like they, they kind of relax a little bit. And to get back on pace takes a while. And Newcastle exploited that yesterday. We didn't have Casemiro and Ericsson. I'll speak about that in a little bit. There's a couple of super chats. Let me read these out from, from you here. Uh, Jibak, you're saying, watching us yesterday, I'm convinced this is more than a three-window rebuild. We need to overhaul our bench to stop reverting to Ole Ball randomly. It depends whether you're talking about summers as a window or whether you're talking about summer, winter, summer as in two. So we've already had two windows. You think it's more than a three-window rebuild? I think Manchester United, if we get this summer right, I mean, there is so much to do this summer. I question whether we'd have the ability to do what we need to do. And we won't get everything done in this summer. I don't think we will. But there is so much that we could change this summer that I, I think we could be a very, very different shaped strength squad next year. Far better than what we've got right now. So I'm not sure whether I'd agree that it's a three-window re I mean, I remember everybody was talking about years and years and years away. And this season, we've beaten City, Liverpool, Arsenal and Spurs all at Old Trafford and Barcelona. That's when we got our strongest 11. Alex, you're saying how many poor midfield performances without Casemiro and Eriksen do we have to watch before Zidane or Maynou gets the chance? Surely they can do better than McTominay. I think it's a, I think it's a fair question to ask at this point. And the reality is that Eric Ten Hag, as a manager, knows more than we do, right? He's got experience of bringing through youth players and turning them into first-team stars. 
So I'm going to have to trust his instinct into when Kobe Mainu is is right to use in that situation. Because look, I'm I, I've I've got so many things to run through and discuss this morning with you, um, and of course the main thing is around these guys, but also around ugh, it's just everything, everything yesterday bad about the performance was all around our midfield. Everything stemmed from there. Every everything bad stemmed from there anyway. There's another super chat there. Let me read this out and let me read a few of your a few of your comments out as well. Estevo, how you doing, buddy? Thank you for the support. So and I would argue the fact that when we lost when we lose, we practically give up as a team. So either we grind out a result, we get thrashed. Ten Hag mentions a lack of passion and intensity after a loss. Now there's there, there's people that are going to be and I've seen it, slating and slagging Ten Hag yesterday for not going in hard on the players, for not sort of admitting his own faults because yesterday Ten Hag made some mistakes, right? I'm open, I'm I'm fine enough to admit it. Again, you know full well, a anybody who accuses me with an agenda here is just, <laughs> it's hilarious. It, it genuinely makes me laugh at this point in time, anybody who accuses me of an agenda. Really is quite funny because yesterday Ten Hag made some mistakes. He went for the risky move in those last 15, 20 minutes of bringing off uh, Ver Varane and Martinez and putting Lindelof on and having one centre-back on there. It was his way of saying, right, just throw the kitchen sink at them. Now, I would prefer there to be a Manchester United manager who at 1-0 down goes, you know what, sod this. I'd rather lose 2-0 and chase that equaliser than just try and grind out a 1-0. That's... It was a risky move and it didn't pay off. But then other than that, you could argue that he made tactical errors. Now, with the midfield, right? Let's go with this man. Eric Ten Hag yesterday, you understood he, you understood exactly what his logic was. Without these two, is it that, that photo there? No, wrong, wrong one. That one there? Oh, geez, we'll have a shot. Without these two, right? Man United have to compromise everywhere. It's compromise. It is square pegs, round holes, no matter what setup you do. Ah, oh, Sam, play Fred alongside Sabitzer. Compromise. Play McTominay there, a little bit deeper than Sabitzer. Compromise. Play Bruno there alongside. Compromise. Play Martinez, bring him out. Compromise. Every single thing is a compromise. Now, there are some of you that will think that Kobe Mainu, oh, it's, it's at least worth a crack. Sure. But the reason Ten Hag did what he did yesterday he played Bruno Fernandes deeper with Sabitzer. Why did he do that? Because this dude scored four goals in two games during the international break. So Ten Hag, as a manager, because he's a man who recognises form, said, you know what? I'll play Matomane a little bit further up. If Bruno can play deeper, get the balls up to him. I understood the logic. But it didn't work. It did not work. Bruno playing in that deeper role he wasn't able to do anything because Newcastle's press was so well organized. And that's what I mean. Luke Shaw is trying to say that trying to say that Newcastle are uh, they only won the game because of passion. That's really that's not the truth. And I can admit that. Newcastle were good. Their finishing was woeful. If their finishing was as good as their pressing and their defending, we would have got absolutely pumped yesterday. Luckily for us, it wasn't. However, and herein lies the big however. And I, I, I have been pretty on the fence about this because I can see the positives, but I'm not on the fence anymore. Manchester United need a new goalkeeper. All right? I've... And honestly, if you can't see it, you're closing your eyes because you don't want to see it. All right? Manchester United yesterday... Every time we were in this position, my head was in my hands. Every time we were, we were in this position, I was like, oh, this is not going to end well. And it didn't. And I'm not sure it ever will. We go over here and we see this position. And we see five Newcastle players in the shot. We see Delo out there hugging the right wing. We see... Scott McTominay. Now, technically, he's available for a pass there. But is Varane really going to do that when McTominay is inside a pentagon of five Newcastle players? 
I, 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 I don't know how many more times I have to explain this. I don't know how many more times I have to. Honestly. David De Gea is not the goalkeeper for Eric Ten Hag's system. He won't be. He won't be. And Ten Hag saying that he wants to keep De Gea. I'm going to presume that's because he he knows he's not going to have the budget this summer to bring in that new goalkeeper. And yeah, De Gea, look, De Gea made some great saves. I actually called it in the I called it in my match reaction. I said, look, I think everyone sort of deserves criticism. I said, kind of apart from De Gea because of the world class saves he made, but just I I could honestly, if I really did probably in depth research. I could find 10, 15, 20 different games, 10, 15, 20 different examples of Manchester United in situations like this where we cannot pass out from the back. Down there in the comments, what we've got. Without De Gea, the scoreline would have been higher. The keeper doesn't have anything to do with the loss yesterday. With or without the good, good keeper. Yeah, look, Bruce, you're right. With or without the good keeper. We played horribly yesterday. <sighs> Guys, Carl, you can't blame the keeper for yesterday. He was mad of the match. <laughs> Honestly, I, 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 I'm, I'm, it's not that I'm done with this because De Gea deserves so much praise. But I, this is definitely going to be a, a, one of those situations where people, we're, we're, we're going to be split on this. All right. De Gea isn't the guy. De Gea is a problem for this Manchester United team with Eric Ten Hag's philosophy, foundations of build-up play. It will not work. Okay? Modern goalkeepers are different to what they were four, five years ago when David De Gea was probably the best goalkeeper in the world. If you can't see that, you're ignoring it. And you're just focusing on those saves. <laughs> it, 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 honestly... It, I'm staggered if you can't see it now. I'm staggered if you can't look at this and realize that it is the fundamental part of the problem. Now, it comes in two parts. Number one, let me see if I can get my, I think I can pull this up here. Yeah, cool. Oh, look at that. Live and direct. Number one, you've got a problem. Let me, one second there, get rid of that. Right. Let's get these up. Does that work there? Number one, you've got a problem there, right? Where's the midfielders? You need your midfielders there to be dropping into spaces, dropping into spaces. Because you've got the two centre-backs there that are stayed wide. They're two options for David De Gea to pass to. Luke Shaw, look, you can't even see the low. He's that far up there, but he's getting marked out of the game. Shaw's getting marked out of the game. So De Gea's options are limited, right? So I'm not putting that. At his, at his feet. I'll be honest, I think that pass to Varane, he's kind of put... <sighs> There's just so many problems. There are so many problems and I really don't want to get into an argument with people. Now, there's absolutely no doubt that if Casemiro and Eriksen play yesterday, right, then you you don't... This situation doesn't exist, Right? This situation doesn't exist yesterday because if Casemiro and Eriksen are playing, you are going to have options, options. You might even have Bruno dropping a little bit deeper into there as well. And all of a sudden, Manchester United have the ability to play out from the back. So that's what I mean. I'm not just looking at David De Gea here. But it's both. And they are both equally as responsible. David De Gea and that lack of confidence he has in, that, in this situation it's so easy to play against Manchester United. All you've got to do is do what Newcastle did. Play with the front three there on the edge of the box. Don't worry about the space you're going to leave behind because they're not really going to go there. And people are down, no way can you, no way can you blame De Gea. You can't blame De Gea. As I said, De Gea and the lack of midfield options there created a situation where Manchester United just could not play out from the back with the ball. And Newcastle were laughing at us. And they did it so easy. 
that's what happens when you don't have Casemiro and Eriksen playing. And it's also what happens when you have a goalkeeper who just isn't confident in that environment. I'm sorry, people, but if you can't see it now, if you can't see it now, you never will. Honestly, you never will. And this is this is <laughs> the situation is only going to get worse. <laughs> I, I I wished it wasn't going to get worse because there was a point this season. I can't remember what, what game it was. There was a few games where I watched and I was like, I was like, De Gea looks like he's getting a bit more confident with playing out from the back. Nah, man, it's just get it's just we're going backwards. We're going backwards there. However, I think it's about priorities. And that is where the issue lies, because if we go over here and we look at where, where Manchester United's priorities lie this summer, and that's going to be the main part of the conversation we're having down here in the comments now, is around what we need to do this summer. And a number one target for Eric Ten Hag is a striker. And about Veghorst yesterday, people are going to be, people are going to be uh, highlighting how, ba how bad Veghorst was. And he was bad. Should Veghorst be starting 19 games in a row for Manchester United? No. There's your short answer. Absolutely no way should he be starting 19 games in a row. What other options have we had? Now, you're going to come and be saying, Sam, you could play Rashford through the middle. You could have played Garnacho on the left. You could play Sam. OK, put Rashford out of position, apart from the fact he scored 27 goals for Manchester United. Said, no, you play Rashford on the left. Who else plays up front? Martial. He's been injured the whole time. Martial came off the bench yesterday, and I think he looked pretty good. I imagine Martial, fingers crossed, he's fit to start against Brentford. He, he plays 65 minutes. Then we bring Veghorst on for the last 25. Good. Good. Justin, down here, honestly, this, this is going to be, it's not something I take pride in, in sort of arguing with everybody. But I'm just trying to help you realise, Justin, oh my God, De Gea isn't the problem. It's like you want a goalkeeper who's good with his feet and poor with his hands. Let the De Gea issue rest for once. Nope. Nope. I won't. It is a fundamental issue. And if you can't see it, it's because you don't want to see it. Not because it doesn't exist. That's the issue. Any United fan who is trying to argue that De Gea isn't a problem is ignoring the ignoring the evidence that's staring them in the face. Do we have other problems? Hell yes, we do. And that might ultimately be the issue as to why the De Gea situation doesn't get resolved um, sooner rather than later. I think the De Gea issue gets pushed back a year because of what the priorities are this summer. There's a, there's a super chat here, and I think someone's gifted some memberships. So let me read this out, and I'm going to go down and read a few of your comments. So I don't feel like I'm, I feel like I hate the word ranting, but I kind of am. Seven Samurai, how are you doing, buddy? He said, I trust Ten Hag, and I'm sure he's doing the best he can with what he's got. Ultimately, there are too many that lack the quality and the mentality befitting a Manchester United player. There was a big lack of technical quality yesterday, wasn't there? Their course doesn't have that technical quality. McTominay doesn't have that technical quality. Sabitzer, uh, I think he does to a certain degree, but he's more like a, a, a role midfielder, if you know what I mean. He, he, he's he's a, an enabler for those around him. That's kind of how I feel that if Sabitzer joins Manchester United on a permanent deal, that's the kind of role he's going to be sitting in. Um, let me quickly pull this up here. Whoa, 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 whoa. Jeez, I knew someone gifted membership. My God, Jay, what are you doing, man? Jeez, you hero. Wow. Right, that's going straight into the Van Persie pop. Whee! Mate, Jay, I can't even hit that enough. Jay, you absolute ledge. Thank you so much, man. What are you doing gifting 50 today? Of all the days. I love this community, man. This community makes me feel better about watching United. We need this. Remember last year when we had the therapy room open 24-7? <coughs> that was horrendous. And you're saying here, mate, as I, said, I want to say one more time there. Man. Jay, thank you so much, man. Absolute hero. Legend of the community. There's so many legends in this community. It's hard to sort of name them all one after the other. Really are. And you sent a super chat. Oh, thank you very, thank you very much, dude. What are you saying? Mr. Glass's cameo showed about up for the second division striker he actually is. Doing the same thing and expecting a different result is madness. That's not actually the definition of insanity. And I don't know where that ever started from. But it's not. However, Valt Vekos is somebody who gets... Uh, here we go. One sec. I'm, I'm getting distracted again. Do you want me to pull up the stats? David De Gea's shot stopping this season hasn't even been that good. 
He's like 11th or 12th. <sighs> People, this is what I mean. I love David Ayer. I love what he's done for the club. But you, you know that sentiment that's dragging you in? You know that emotion and those memories that are dragging you in? That's why you're not a manager of Manchester United. That's why I'm not a manager of Manchester United. You need to have objectivity here. You need to look at David De Gea. Is he the goalkeeper that fits this Ten Hag system? The answer is no. And I think you all know that. I think you all know that. And if you don't, I believe you're just ignoring stuff that's in front of you. Uh, Addy, you, you kind of agree with me. Um, uh, da, 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 da. Go down here. But Veghorst, right? And you just called him a second division striker there. Veghorst is someone who gets a lot of hate. And there's people... Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go down here and answer a few of your comments. Say, hypothetically, well, I can't say it now because he's, he's fit, but Martial's fit. So with Martial being fit, he comes straight into my team. Of course he does. If Martial had been fit to start any of these last 19 games, would he have started them? Yes, I think he would have. Has he been fit? No. Has Ronaldo been there? No, because he got himself sacked. Did Ten Hag have any money in January to sign a striker? No, because the club is skint. <laughs> it's like, what do you want, people? I know you're right. Their course shouldn't be starting 19 times in a row. Was he the, was he the problem yesterday? No. You touched the ball seven times. We never got the ball up to him for him to mess it up. He had one chance when he was put through by Anthony. Should have hit the target. Didn't. His finishing isn't good enough. We know that. If you really think I'm going to try and throw Veghorst under the bus for that performance yesterday, then that for me isn't root cause analysis. And I like to do root cause analysis. I don't just like to look at, oh, Veghorst, he was crap yesterday. Go back, go back, see where the actual, the, 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 the fundamental starts of the, of the problems at United you, you can disagree with it all you want now. <coughs> Sorry. The lack of Casemiro and Eriksen and David De Gea being our goalkeeper yesterday combined created a scenario where Newcastle dominated. Man United had no out ball and it kept coming back every single time. Every time. Um, and you're going down there. What exactly does Veghorst offer? Well, how about you ask uh, Eric Ten Hag that aunt? Well, no, you're not, you can't do that. But Manchester, people, people, man, speaking about United after a loss, I think that's what our second defeat in, what, like 26, 27 game, something like that. And people are losing their minds. Huge. Oh, throw this out there. Tear that down. Rip it up. Oh, it's, it's, it's crazy. Crazy, 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 crazy. Gregory, you sent a super chat. Let me read this out. De Gea can't came across, can't command his box and can't distribute. But worse, he doesn't talk. Maguire never barked orders either. I don't, I, I, I don't know about um, De Gea's communication, but completely honest, it was just, I'm not allowed to say anything else about David De Gea. I'm not. I've, 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 I've nailed my colours to the mast there. And uh, my opinion on that has been... I, and I'll say this one more time before I move on to the conversation around Harry Kane, which is a really important conversation. I wanted, I was desperate, 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 desperate for David De Gea to refine the sort of distribution that I remember him having when he came back to, when he came to United as a scrawny, was he a teenager back in 2011? I was desperate for that goalkeeper to be found again because he clearly loves Manchester United. He clearly wants to stay. I just do not think he's that guy. Is that uh, is the answer to that David Raya from Brentford? Well, I suppose we'll be looking at how Brentford play on Wednesday night, won't we? That will not be an easy game. By the way, Brentford has scored, if I'm correct, more set pieces than any team in the Premier League this season. They are going to attack us with the set pieces. I am not looking forward to it. It's going to be an uncomfortable game to watch, just like Newcastle was. We've got the home advantage, and we really, really need that. But moving on to the main conversation and the talking point today is around priorities of the summer. Now, The Athletic have, re have released this today. 
saying that Manchester United are sold on Harry Kane. And this is what Laurie Whitwell said. Let's go full screen so you can see this. People close to United who will, as with all sources in this article, remain anonymous, say Eric Ten Hag is sold on Kane as his first choice for a new centre forward. The absolute priority position this summer. Staff have been brought so staff have brought the United manager up to speed on the anecdotal details behind the hard numbers. So you've got Laurie Whitwell and also David Ornstein in a little bit saying that Harry Kane is the priority for Manchester United this summer. Now, I, I, we've done lots of these polls before. I'll do them again. Oh, Bully, oh, thank you so much, man. I've just seen you gifted 55. I'm not 50. Uh, that was that's for Jay. You gifted five memberships. Thank you very much, dude. Ah. By the way, ladies and gents, I'm working in the background on the new software. So the big, the big, big upgrade to United People's TV. We've got the, the desk all sorted here. The second part of the upgrade is happening. That's coming soon. Um, but Harry Kane, I'm going to do a poll now. We've had this poll before. We'll do this poll again in the future. Who is your choice? Uh, Kane, uh, who, who else can we put on there? You can put Kane, Osserman. I don't really think Vlahovic is a potential is a real option, I'll be honest. And Ramos, you could argue he is. I'll put those four down there. You can let me know who you think your choice is. But Harry Kane, right? Apparently, he is our number one target. Uh, Gus, you're down there saying Hoyland, uh, Rasmus Hoyland, of course. I mean, come on, people. Nobody was talking about him about until about three weeks ago, and all of a sudden he's banged in five in European qualifiers, and all of he's what he's our number one target. Hold your horses, hold your horses. If Manchester United sign a young striker this summer, someone like Rasmus Hoyland, someone like Evan Ferguson, it will have to be with someone on top of that. Don't think we can be looking towards a young player to come and solve our problems. But Harry Kane, right? This is probably the biggest problem I would say about Harry Kane. Uh, is Poch. If Poch goes back to Spurs, there's no chance that Kane leaves. If Poch goes back to Spurs, Kane retires at Spurs. That's my prediction. And with the news yesterday that um, Graham Potter has been sacked by Chelsea, right? In my opinion, Julian Nagelsmann to Chelsea feels pretty inevitable. Feels pretty inevitable. <clears throat> but Harry Kane, and this is the question, right? You see the man himself there. He was a certain, I think he was 29 when we signed him. Manchester United lost the league on goal difference to City. What did we do? We went out and we signed the best striker in the league. And what happened the year after? We won the league at a canter. Van Persie was incredible that season. One of the best debut seasons I think you're ever likely to see. <clears throat> And Van Persie, my, my word. Now, the conversation around Kane is, could Kane be that player for Manchester United and for Eric Ten Hag? You let me know what you think about this in the comments below. But there's one thing for sure about any move for Harry Kane. All right, let's see if it's down here. See if it's written in the article. Work is being done to assess whether the transfer is achievable. And that is the issue, right? I really don't know whether Harry Kane is achievable. The good thing is, and, and this is, again, this is about preparation. This is the 3rd of April, right? Manchester United need to do the groundwork now. Get Levy on the phone, speak to him. 100 million, if we're talking about 100 million, cool. And everyone's going to have argue, arguments and conversations. Oh, Kane's not worth 100 mil because he's 30, blah, blah, blah. Harry Kane is the best striker in the Premier League over the last five years. And I don't think anybody is even slightly close. Harry Kane is a goal scorer who will guarantee pretty much 20 Premier League goals if he stays injury free for the next three years for Manchester United. You can't say that Harry Kane would be a bad signing. Because he wouldn't be. Would Harry Kane be the ideal signing? There's a debate to be had there. And that comes down to profiles, right? 
Steve, you're down there saying RVP didn't cost 100 million. Well, who cost 100 million back in 2012? Uh, well, what's the point in comparing transfer fees then to transfer fees now? Enzo Fernandez has just gone to Chelsea for 120 million euros. Therefore, we're all screwed. You know how Neymar to PSG, that was a transfer that sort of blew up the whole market. Enzo Fernandez to Chelsea has blown up the whole market for everybody else in the Premier League. The numbers, <clears throat> don't get too bogged down into the numbers. Honestly, you, you'll go mad. I agree. 100 mil for a 30 well, Weird. Weird. Odd. Overpaid. Yep. Uh, is it going to be the market rate? Yep. Let me see what you're saying down here about Harry Kane then. All right. And then I'll head down to the poll. <clears throat> Alex, you're saying Kane would be a good signing, but not the ideal one. We would blow the whole budget on him and still have some midfield problems unresolved. Well, we actually wouldn't. But and of course, this is going to go down to uh, tied into everything to do with the new owners. We know Laurie Whitwell confirmed that after the release of the latest financial results, the Manchester United are actually going to be clearing our overdraft, effectively. We're going to pay off the credit card. So by the time that June 30th comes around, our, it's called a revolving credit facility. It's an overdraft. It's just Man United's overdraft isn't, what, 1,500 quid like, like us normal folk. It's 300 million. That's going to be now down to zero. So if Manchester United spend this summer, we know full well that we could spend somewhere in the region of two to 300 on, on that same facility. And that doesn't add into the fact that we are going to make money from sales. So I think the funds will be there this summer. When it comes to FFP, I need to look into the actual numbers themselves to see exactly how United could, could um, sign uh, in terms of how much we could spend. I'm going to go down and read a few of your comments down here. RVP was the icing on the cake, but right now our cake is not ready. <coughs> One sec. I'm still coughing, by the way. Two weeks. I've this now. I think that's a good comment there from Partiv. In terms of Van Persie was the icing on the cake, a team which lost the league on goal difference, and we signed the best goal scorer and we win the league. <coughs> um, without game management, even Kane will flop at United. Jamie Donaldson, Kane is too old. We should be getting a younger striker. What do we get? Three years max out of Kane? Jamie, if we sign Harry Kane and we win the league, you think any United fan cares how long, how old he is? No, I don't think anybody does. It's about, it's going to be such an interesting debate. George, you're saying Harry Kane top bottler. Harry Kane is an unreal goal scorer. And he's, had, he's turned into a bit of a playmaker as well. This, what, this last couple of seasons at Spurs? Dropped deeper with Spurs because he's not been getting the service. I imagine, <clears throat> get yourself some cough syrups. I've had so much, honestly. I haven't even had a drink in these last two weeks. Nothing. Uh, let me see what else you're saying down here. I think Harry is the cheaper option. I mean, cheaper? I mean, it's going to be a lot of money. How much? Let me see what the poll is saying, right? Right now, there are 400 votes in. Osiman has got 55%. Kane has got 32%. With... Vlahovic getting 4% and Ramos getting 9%. If we're talking about expensive players, steer clear of Gonzalo Ramos. It's Benfica. My word. How much are they going to ask for him? The issue, of course, as I said, is Spurs. And I've I've done my um, video earlier this, what, two, three weeks ago on Harry Kane and the red flags I see around any move for Harry Kane. And they all revolve around Spurs and the uncertain future. If they get Poch back in, I don't think I think Kane is just off the cards. If Poch goes back, dead it. Just dead it now. And that's why <clears throat> I'm happy that we're having these conversations on the 3rd of April. Ten Hag's chosen his priority target. Okay, cool. Find out between now and the end of the season whether that's genuinely achievable. Because we cannot afford a runaround with Daniel Levy and a summer-long, drawn-out saga for a new striker. Just cannot afford to do it. That's the biggest red flag for me around any move for Harry Kane. I think the arguments about profile and, and tactical involvements and what he brings compared to Osman, I think that's a secondary conversation. So the idea of saying, look, 
if Harry Kane's not available, don't have the conversation. Let me see what else you're saying down here. DP saying, isn't Kane too slow compared to how we want to play? I mean, Harry Kane, I don't think he is. Is he going to be the man that bursts through and leads our counter-attack? No. That'll be the two wingers. Would Harry Kane then be perfectly timed on the edge of the box for that cutback? Yes, he would. He absolutely would be. And he does offer that playmaker ability. And Osman, if we're looking at link-up play, he's probably the biggest glaring weakness in his game. Osman is somebody who... One sec. Jeez. <clears throat> Osman is somebody who Manchester United will need to have brilliant service to feed. If you get the balls into him, he's going to score. But he won't link the play up. Harry Kane is a different profile of striker to that. And it depends how much Ten Hag focuses on that link-up. Because if link-up play is important to Ten Hag as an asset of his striker, he won't be looking at Osman because it's just a massive flaw of his game. But, there, I mean, this is going to be an argument that goes on and on and on. But going back to what I was saying, so we ran through here what um, Laurie Whitwell said on Harry Kane. Let's run through what David Ornstein has said about the priority list for Manchester United. As I said down here about the fact that Manchester United will be able to spend money because we're going to be clearing that credit card. This is an interesting conversation to have now. United's priority position this summer is Harry Kane, a centre forward. Checks have been made on Victor Osserman, Gonzalo Ramos and Evan Ferguson. But United are also aware of other strikers who may be available on who may be on the move this summer. Remember that um, Marcus Churam is leaving Borussia Mönchengladbach for free, for example. And this is where it gets interesting down here because uh, David Ornstein runs through the priority list. So secondary to a striker, Eric Ten Hag wants a midfielder in the style of a number eight. And I wanted, I wanted to know what you thought about that. I wanted to know what you think about the idea that Man United's midfield priority signing is a number eight. Because for me, if we're looking at what, what a number eight is, a number eight is a Tony Cruz type player, a Luka Modric type player, a real playmaker, Sometimes drops deep, but somebody who can go between both boxes. Ivan Tony being mentioned as an excellent centre forward choice, and he really is. Shame he didn't pick up a yellow card in their game against Brighton because he would have been suspended on Wednesday. But watch Ivan Tony on Wednesday. He's a good striker. Um, the idea that Man United need a number eight, I think I can understand the logic of it. And I was gonna, let me quickly show you here. Actually, I don't really need to show you. <clears throat> If we want a number eight, it's because Eric Ten Hag sees Casemiro and Eriksen as being those two deeper midfielders. And he can chop and change between them. I think next season, if we do go all out and we sign a big, powerful number eight, whoever that may be, we don't have, need to have this conversation this morning. Then it's going to be Casemiro and Eriksen switching in that number six position. Not number six per se. It won't be somebody who sits, but some, that deeper of the three midfielders. It'll be Casemiro and Eriksen chopping and changing rather than both playing every single week. And then that new number eight playing in front of whoever that is. I get the logic. But we definitely need a midfield signing. <clears throat> and I think you could... You could argue that... Honestly, I think you could argue that a, a new midfielder of the ilk of these two, of Casemiro and Eriksen, is equally as important as signing a new centre-forward, right? Both of those are fundamental positions that United need to improve. And I'd argue they're... I'd probably still say number one is uh, a new centre-forward. I think we've all known that for a long time. But it is painful how bad Manchester United... Honestly, that's a word I would describe. I would describe it. Painful. How bad United are without Casemiro and Eriksen. My word. My word. Um, in a fantasy world, Valverde, says Jonathan. Man, Valverde. 
how has he, I don't know how he's become that good. He is an unreal player. And then the idea there that if Man United do sign that striker and do sign that uh, central midfielder, a number eight position, rather than a number six, and that's going to be a thing that a lot of you disagree with. A lot of you are going to be like, no, Sam, we need to sign a Casemiro replacement, somebody who just screens and protects. And I can understand the logic here. But there's no, we need, what we need is that deeper line playmaker who receives the ball off the two centre backs, who stops situations like this happening. Scott McTominay is so far away from Varane there, and there's three closer players in the ball. It's just a dangerous pass. It was just a dangerous situation. But the idea there that we might be letting uh, Wan Bissaka leave <clears throat> and then bring in a new right back. That makes total, that makes perfect sense. wan he's been, I, I had to eat plenty of humble pie this year because wan has been brilliant. And if he was fit yesterday, I would have started him over the low. Alanson Maximan, who could have predicted? Who could possibly have predicted that? Alan, my voice went really high there. Who could have predicted that St. Maximum was going to be their most dangerous player yesterday? Uh, apart from absolutely everybody. Newcastle had their game plan down to a T. You knew what they were going to do. But they were very good at doing it. And that's why, I mean, Luke Shaw tried to say they didn't win it with quality. Come on, man. Who are you kidding? Yes, they did. Newcastle won it with application, with desire. Yes, those cliche words, which just weren't there yesterday. But it's not the first time it happened. Whenever there's big breaks in games, the good thing for United is that there's a game coming in, what, 40, 48 hours or there or thereabouts. Just in on Wednesday. Is it Wednesday or Thursday? Wednesday night, I think it is. Jeez. We play Brentford at home and our home record's excellent. It's going to be a tough game, but United will have more because we're playing in front of the crowd at Old Trafford. I've just shown you earlier this in the show today, is it that one there? United's away record's abysmal, but United's home record equally so. For us to be fourth in the league with an away record like that, <clears throat> it's impressive. It really is impressive. Let me quickly go down here and make sure I'm not missing anything. Uh, Aaron, thank you very much, dude. You just gifted a membership to... MS, great shop. Percy Pigs. Big up the Percy Pig gang. Matt Richard, you say sell the low over AWB. No, I'm, no, I, I disagree with that, my friend. I definitely disagree with that comment. Jonathan, you're saying I don't understand these modern managers who are packing a midfield when you know you're up against it, a 4 3 3 obsession. Are you talking about the inverted fullback? Sure, dropping in. It's about adding the extra body in midfield to hopefully make build up easier. And it just didn't work yesterday. Just didn't work yesterday. If I'm talking about uh, positives yesterday, I actually quite enjoyed watching Anthony yesterday. I think he kind of had Dan Byrne on toast. Dan Byrne, he was like, it's like being defended by just a brick wall. Dan Byrne's huge. But he, he, I liked Anthony yesterday. Some nice touches, some smart touches. It wasn't, it was showboating in the right way. It was using flair and trickery to sort of get past Dan Byrne. Uh, I think he felt aggrieved to go off, and I think you can understand that. And that, again, that's probably going to be something that you'll say in the comments is, I can't believe that Ten Hag took Anthony off of Sancho. <clears throat> but Ten Hag wanted more control. He wanted more players who had the ability to play intricate football to actually string passing moves together. Man, they just didn't do it. They just didn't do it yesterday. It was just, that's what I mean. I wish I could just put all of this at the feet of um, the fact that we didn't have Casemiro and Eriksen. But there's not one player yesterday or manager who is exempt from criticism. There is a big difference between just shouting and slagging at someone or saying something with the intention of it becoming a lesson that you turn into a positive. Ten Hag has made so many good stuff. We have scored more goals from subs than any team in the league. We have had so many second half turnarounds all season long. He got it wrong against Newcastle. And I think he'll admit that. And it's not something to throw him at. It's just, it was, it was put, it was just, everything was poor yesterday. But Tom and A didn't do it in that, that advanced midfield role because the ball never went there. Fed course had seven touches in the first half because the ball never went there. And then when he did have a chance, he spooned it wide. Hey, it was a tough day at the office. And after two weeks, after waiting for two weeks, it was pretty painful. Now, my video tomorrow is going to be the Brentford 11. We kick on. Uh, I'm going to Morocco on Wednesday for a week. 
So we've only got lives today. Tomorrow's going to be my last live stream for a week. I'm going on a delayed holiday from last summer. I was going to go and then we, I had to cancel because then we signed Casemiro and Anthony. I was like, I can't leave now. So I've decided, I've realized that summer holidays probably aren't going to happen much for me anymore. I'm going to have to do my holidays at a different time. So I'm going to try and go there. But I still, we'll still be doing videos out in Morocco, just not live videos. Uh, last couple of minutes of the show, you let me know what you think. Give me your questions, questions about anything. And, and make sure you enter the raffle, right? <clears throat> the winner for the PS5, I announced it at the start of the show. I'll announce it one more time here. Congratulations to you, sir. Umit of Balik Cioglu contacted him. Legend. Thank you so much for entering the raffle. And look, he's won a PS5. I think he bought six tickets. He's won a PS5 for six quid. You know how cool that is? That really is cool. Um, but yeah, the giveaway, not the giveaway, the raffle this month. I keep wanting a giveaway. I'm doing giveaways on top as well. Um, we're still organizing the entry mechanic for this, by the way. That's the commemorative scarf from Wembley. It's going to be going to a member. Got all the members' names on a on a spin wheel now. We're just going to spin that, spin that wheel, and one of you will be winning that. Let's see what's going on here. Don't worry, Sam. You'll cancel that again when the <laughs> Ricardo. I'm genuinely worried about that. I think there's going to be a big announcement on the takeover. A big announcement on the takeover that's going to be happening this week. We all expected it by Saturday. Nothing happened. I I anticipate. In this next week, there's going to be a big update. And hopefully it's an update that that we like. Let's be completely honest. Charlie, you're right. How dare you go on holiday, Sam? It's disgusting, isn't it? Absolutely disgusting of me. Um, what else are you saying down here? Right, let's let us let us leave it. Let, let's leave it at that. It wasn't a good game, right? There's lessons to be learned. There's lessons that we already knew there. In fact... There's not many lessons to be learned from yesterday that are new lessons. They're repetitions of problems and mistakes that we've seen all season long. How we react and learn from those. We've reacted, we've reacted pretty well so far. And now we've got Brentford and Everton at home. Honestly, if we come out of those two games with six points, that Newcastle one will shrug our shoulders. Everything is still in our hands. At this point in the season, everything's still in our hands. But that was shocking. Really, really was. Thank you all for... And I'll say one more time, Jay, you're an absolute hero, man. Thank you so much for gifting 50 memberships. I always say to everybody, you're all legends. So thank you, man. Um, yeah. Onwards and upwards. We will move on. We will move forward. But I tell you what, it's going to be a grind. Between now and the end of the season, that's what I will say. Prepare yourself because there's, there's going to be some more speed bumps. We need to grind this season out. If we can grind it out and get a top four spot, then it's a successful season. If we can grind it out, get a top four spot and do something in a cup competition, even better. It's going to be a tough slog and it's not the best reintroduction, but I'm not overly surprised by it. After the break, Newcastle exposing our problems in the build-up play and no Casemiro and Eriksen. It was painful. We'll move forward, hopefully kick it off with a win against Brentford on Wednesday. Thank you very much for tuning in. I'll be here with a lunchtime video a little bit later on. Take it easy, everyone.